Hi, I'm Chris Kramer. I'm a faculty member here in the Department of Chemistry at the University of Minnesota. Earlier this year, the Chemistry Graduate Student Workshop Committee asked me to give a presentation on how to give a presentation. Uh, having created materials for that uh, lecture to the members of that committee, postdocs, graduate students in the department, I thought it might be useful to actually make this available more generally for people who might be interested and as a result I've created this online presentation. So the software I'm using in order to accomplish the presentation does let me embed a video of myself uh, into the screen throughout the, uh, throughout the slide presentation, but it's a little bit distracting to constantly be there and it takes up space on the screen. So after this initial welcome piece, I plan to dispense with the video. I'll still have a voiceover, but otherwise the only thing on the screen will be presentation materials. However, I did want to take this opportunity to look people in the digital eye and say welcome, and I hope you find this useful. All right, so this is the how to give a talk talk. And I, I think I want to start by saying, you know, what's at stake when you give a talk? Uh, perhaps it's the first time you've been invited to make a presentation outside your your home institution where you're training, and I'm going to tell you, and I'm maybe going to frighten you, that absolutely everything is at stake. And we're in the middle of uh, interviewing candidates as we speak for faculty positions in chemistry here at the University of Minnesota, and a job candidate lives or dies in that one hour. Actually, they get two, they give a research presentation, and they also uh, give a talk about their future research plans here. But in any case, it's that uh, time spent standing in front of an audience and trying to get scientific ideas across that really matter. And I'm also going to say, uh, and I hope I don't sound jaundiced or elitist or whatever, but three quarters of all talks I attend I consider to be a waste of my time because people have paid insufficient attention to the details uh, that they need to uh, put into an effective presentation. So here's my attempt to give back to the community and uh, think about all the things I've seen in the 25% of talks that aren't a waste of my time. And hopefully I can get across some things and you'll find some nuggets of wisdom in here that'll be useful for you as well. And uh, if this all sounds a bit scary, I'm going to just say to you, don't fear the risk. Embrace the opportunity for reward. Be the 25%. I'm picking a number other than that percentage, which uh, made the news more, more completely in the last year. All right, so before you start, what are the things that you should be thinking about? Well, uh, first and foremost, I will say to you, know your audience. Uh, that is, you know, sometimes I'm asked to give talks to groups of undergraduates. Sometimes I'm talking at a Gordon Research Conference. Perhaps I'm doing uh, some outreach in a K-12 school in the community. Obviously, those require different levels of talks, and you should tune your material to your audience. And there's nothing impolite about asking to know more about an audience when you receive an invitation to speak. And so I'll emphasize that. Ask if you're not sure. Particularly for a departmental lecture, uh, it's very useful to say, will this be a collection of, say, only the organic chemists in the department? Is it the entire department? Is it, uh, will undergraduates be attending as part of coursework, for example? Try to get a good feel for what levels you should be speaking to. Know your time limit. There is nothing more rude, in my personal opinion, than going over the amount of time that you have allotted for your presentation. It's disrespectful to the audience. It is uh, disrespectful to yourself because people are not going to be inspired to ask you questions because many of them are fidgeting and need to get on to their next appointment. And once again, ask if unsure. Uh, most people assume there's sort of this canonical hour talk, but you may find out from uh, your host that actually they would love it if you'd give a 45-minute talk and devote 15 minutes to questions. And those question periods are often the most fun. So again, uh, ask if you're unsure. What about technology? Nowadays, of course, most things are done in some digital way and you plug in your favorite presentation software. But again, it can't hurt to know ahead of time uh, what you'll be facing and what kind of room you may be in. So ask if unsure and as you see, you get it. You find out the details ahead of time. I'm also going to tell you, you know, think about what impression are you trying to make. Obviously, if it's a job talk, you are trying to illustrate your professionalism. You are trying to inspire people to uh, make you a job offer, for example. But I would go beyond that and say that, you know, a presentation, a seminar, however we want to call it, is really a performance. And so, uh, just like any performance, there is a certain aspect, I, I hesitate to call it entertainment, that makes it sound as though we're somehow diminishing the sterling quality of science. But there is an entertainment or a performance characteristic to it 
And you should think about that. You should think about your costume. That is, what are you wearing? And so generally, uh, my advice is you want to wear something that illustrates a level of professionalism, but also thinks about the audience. So I'll come back to that. So when I give talks to, say, K through 12 students, if that happens, I don't want to be so intimidating that they're afraid to uh, engage with me during the course of the talk or afterwards. So while I'll attempt to look professional at some level that shows respect for my audience and respect for the science I'm talking about, I may not go with the you know most sartorial outfit I have at my command because I don't want to seem so far outside their experience of what they see dressing around them that they're intimidated. Uh, and that actually goes for undergrads too. They're, they can be intimidated as well, even if they're a bit older. Uh, I'll also say, you know, interact with your audience as you are giving your presentation. People who turn their back to an audience and talk to the screen for 60 minutes are in my 75% category. Uh, it's just, it's not interesting. It's easy to lose your audience. They are all going to pull out their smartphones and begin surfing uh, while you are, you've got your back to them. It's not even rude to you. They don't, you don't even know. Uh, try to make eye contact. Try to move around the room. Try to modulate your voice in such a way that you emphasize important things uh, and attract attention and be interesting, essentially. And then finally, of course, uh, it's, it's good to practice a presentation. Uh, if you've never given it before, it's particularly good to practice. After you've done tens, hundreds, thousands, of course, you often do these things a little bit colder but it's good to think about what you're going to say on individual slides. I, I've also added here, it helps until it hurts. You can over-practice. Uh, often we'll get a job candidate who comes in and gives an extremely wooden presentation where it's clear that almost the entire talk is memorized at this point. It's been practiced so many times. And that also sort of detracts from the spontaneity, the interest, the spark that's going to keep you engaged. So what about a title slide? Uh, that's where everybody starts typically, and you've got it uh, up on the screen, and it should be eye-catching and engaging. Uh, and so I, I've got some advice here, and that is I think your title should not be too long or too technical. Remember, your, your talk will often be advertised by some email or some flyers that will include the title, and you will want to uh, attract the largest audience you can. And you do that by having something that's short and not off-putting in acronyms or uh, extremely high levels of science. And I would say the same if you're asked for an abstract. Uh, this is in the know your audience category, but you want to uh, provide information that's going to be engaging, that's going to be welcoming, and you're going to explain something. People will want to go because they're going to learn something. If it just looks like gobbledygook to them, they're going to think that's what they're going to hear, and uh, they may not attend, and that's not what you want. I usually like to list the names of my coworkers on the title slide because it gives me an opportunity to thank them for their, converse, for their uh, contributions right up front. I usually will try to do that at the end as well, but every once in a while, time being what it is, uh, one may, something can happen. So why not thank the really key people who made contributions right at the start? And it doesn't hurt to thank anybody twice. And then uh, a time and a date. So you see this talk was originally given March 20th of 2012. And a few uh, eye-catchy things that perhaps say where you're coming from. So a loon is the state bird of Minnesota. We've got some nice fall colors. You see the chemistry department of the University of Minnesota there. And that, that animal is a gopher for those of you who don't know the mascot of the University of Minnesota. So uh, here I am giving away my secrets after 20 years and, and happy to do it. Uh, so I'll say a good talk is a storytelling performance. And so I told you in terms of uh, trying to engage an audience Imagine that you are indeed telling a story. For those who have children and have told uh, uh, stories to them as they've grown up, you know, seven-year-old, that's right about where you want to shoot for. You can certainly respect your audience as having an uh, intellectual capacity above a seven-year-old, but uh, they're going to listen to you when you pitch it in that kind of engaging way, So, that from a stylistic standpoint at least. I'll also say in general that less is more. And so one of the most common mistakes in uh, presented lectures, I would say, is an attempt to shove as so much as you possibly can into your allotted time limit, usually with the idea that, oh, I will impress my audience by showing them how much work I got done. And I really think that's counterproductive. What you want is an audience that goes away and says, I really learned something. I felt like this person who just gave a presentation expanded my knowledge base and did so by teaching me at a pace and at a level that it got through to me. And when you're trying to cram four stories in, in a 60-minute talk, 
Uh, you often will not, in fact, get things at a level of detail that people learn anything. They just kind of feel as though a train blew by them, and they're disappointed that they wasted their hour. It is a very common mistake among students to assume that uh, since I, the presenter, have been thinking deeply about this subject for the last three to four years of my life, surely everyone else in the room is just as up on it as I am, and I will dive in at the highest level and assume an enormous background and experience that just isn't there. And so it's quite important in the early slides to set a context, explain why the science you're doing is interesting, uh, explain I'm going to go into this in a tiny bit more detail in a moment, but you know, bring people in at a pace that you would expect reasonable for an informed scientist, but not an expert in your area. And so I have her on the slide teach to Jethro, and I was thinking of uh, Jethro Clampett of the Beverly Hillbillies, if you remember that, if you're of a certain age, you might. But in any case, uh, something of a naive, uh, very interested in various things, but if you could get a, a concept across to Jethro, well, you definitely will get it across to anybody. Uh, so again, I'm going to say never run long. Never, I've got that in, in italics, it's disrespectful. It illustrates your inability to plan. So if somebody was thinking about making you a job offer and you've just shown you don't know the difference between 60 minutes and 75, uh, they may question your, uh, your competence. And if you do have to cut material, just cut it, even on the fly. I have never felt badly if a speaker has said, you know, I just don't want to go into this uh, remaining part. I don't think I have enough, so I'm going to wrap up here and I'm happy to... Uh, take questions at this stage. Certainly if you do practice you'll get a better feel for how long it's going to take you and the more talks you give the more you'll know what your time per slide is roughly and that'll help you plan talks. So after the title slide how do I like to see a talk organized? What do I think is uh, effective? So one thing I don't like and maybe this is my personal bias I don't like an outline. I think an outline is sort of silly. Are you expecting someone to leave and you wanted to let them know what they were going to miss? You're about to give your talk. Why are you going to tell people ahead of time what it is you're talking about? There they are. Just give your talk. I really like to start with sort of big picture introductory material. Why should someone outside your research group care about what you've been doing? And at some level, this is also how you start writing a paper or you start writing a proposal. Why should anybody care? What is the motivating factor that gives rise to the research you're about to present? Uh, I also think that if you've got data or analysis that's going to rely on some particular instrument, technique, something that is not incredibly well known to everyone in your audience, uh, you should attempt to explain that. But on the other hand, you may decide that it is so specialized or so difficult a technique to explain all the details of that you don't think you can do it in the time you have available, in which case you should do your best, again, to come up with sort of a Jethro explanation that is going to be respectful and helpful to the audience, but uh, you just ask them to trust you that uh, there are some details that are so technical you don't want to spend time on them, and usually an audience is going to be uh, accommodating in that regard. After that stage, so you've now set the stage to talk about what you yourself did, and uh, there are narrative results, and if you've got a lot of results and you want to make conclusions along the way to help guide people, I often think that's a good idea. So interim conclusions, if they're helpful, more results, more conclusions, then I think you should circle back to your big picture and you know tie up your talk in a ribbon. It's also great in many instances to talk about what's next. So... Um, you know, many talks people finish and it looks like everything's done, at least to young scientists, they don't necessarily see that it's op perhaps opened up as many questions as were answered. And uh, it's fun to, to pose those sorts of what's next questions. It helps to launch discussion after a talk often. So I'm going to try to uh, maybe illustrate that in this talk in a certain way, but we'll see that as we go along. Okay, so uh, the big picture introductory material. And I will tell you that students, uh, and the younger they are, the more this is true, they really like this. So even though they are uh, not necessarily perfectly expert and won't follow all the rest of the things that you speak about, they're going to remember they learned something new. They're going to get a big picture perspective, and maybe they'll be drawn in further the next time that that happens. And so, for instance, when I would provide such a big picture summary, I might, I might do this. So I, I often have slides when I give introductory lectures that will be called a one-slide summary of. 
And so my particular area of expertise is computational chemistry, sometimes called theoretical chemistry, molecular modeling. And this Venn diagram is sort of a simple way, and I'm not going to give you my talks, I just want to show sort of example slides, uh, of explaining what is computational chemistry, why do you use it, where are the places that it uh, plays a role in research, and it attempts to sort of place it in a context of experimental chemistry, computational chemistry. This particular slide I often go into history as well, and uh, it sets a stage. This is another introductory slide I often use when I'm uh, giving a research talk on the uh, reactivity of monocopper containing uh, small molecules when they react with molecular oxygen. And part of the motivation is that there are metalloenzymes that do interesting chemistry in living organisms. And because of those metalloenzymes, inorganic chemists want to make small molecule models that can accomplish that interesting chemistry as well. And so people often uh, see that sort of a connection that, okay, there's a biological motivation that leads to a chemical investigation and a modeler may provide insight. Uh, that would be the part that I would be talking about in my talk. And then I'll offer one more uh, final sort of slide I like as a big picture slide. And I'm, I'm, I guess what I'd like to, you to take home from these slides is they're sore, they're, there's not enormous amounts of detail on these slides. They're big pictures. They try to be sort of colorful. Uh, this is an example of a dye-sensitized solar cell, so it probably has the most detail of the three slides that I've shown you up till now. But one can uh, use this slide to explain, A, there's a massive uh, energy crisis on Earth. We all need more energy. Uh, how might one go about harvesting energy? Here's a proposal that captures solar energy and turns it into fuels. Certainly any audience can sort of understand at that level. And then I dive a little more deeply into the chemistry and explain what's, what's happening. And there is a device, if you will, that's shown here in a schematic. And uh, the next step is for me to start talking about which parts of the device a computational chemist plays role in modeling. Uh, and I guess I have one last introductory slide that I sort of like. This is yet another area of research that comes out of my group, and it uh, has to do with the development of certain kinds of models that predict free energies of salvation and other sorts of uh, thermodynamic quantities. And if you're going to talk about thermodynamic quantities to a, a chemistry audience, it's helpful to actually have sort of specific examples. So here's an intro slide that explains to people what is a free energy of salvation and how when it's uh, salvation of a gas molecule into itself as a pure liquid phase, even though it's the same, uh, the same thermodynamic quantity, we usually refer to it in different units and we call it a vapor pressure. And then between two solvents, it's a partition coefficient and that's plays a role in uh, dr the drug industry in uh, predicting bioavailability, for instance. So again, big pictures, bright colors, an attempt to uh, explain why this research is going to be important in a very general context. Okay, so uh, after the introductory slides, what, what might we want to do next? And I mentioned that if you want to discuss instruments, techniques, and the like, you might want to try to get that across. And so here's an example from my field where I want to explain how to do, how, how free energies of salvation are used, and I, I start with trying to give you a big picture idea of what a computational chemist uh, brings to a chemistry game, and that is thinking about so-called potential energy surfaces, and this is a talk about how to give talks. I'm not going to try to explain potential energy surfaces to you, but this is a graphical representation in some sense of how you connect from one kind of a concept, a gas phase concept, to a solvated concept, and it illustrates where the free energy of salvation comes in. So not a lot of technical detail here, but explaining that we have a relationship between the gas phase and solution that's connected by this quantity, and things that chemists are interested in, equilibrium constants, rate constants, we can determine those relating them between these two different kinds of phases, gas and solution. Now this is a slide that's bordering on what I might call the, the busy aspect. If I were giving it to a totally general audience, I probably wouldn't use this slide. If I'm talking to physical chemists, this is sort of the, the level of uh, technical detail that may in fact be useful. And so it includes equations, and uh, I would say if you do have equations, it, you are obligated to explain those equations and make sure that they're clear, and I'll, I'll say more about that perhaps in a second. Um, you don't want too much on any one slide, and you, you would like to try to turn the equations into conceptual ideas, so you see there are some graphics on here, 
that illustrate uh, what, what, if you like, happens from manipulating quantities from a more conceptual standpoint. And again, I don't want to dive too much into chemistry, so I won't talk about electrostatic potentials and partial atomic charges, but this would be the sort of thing that would inform follow-on discussion. This is what's required to generate the data. Now I'm going to talk to you about data and uh, you will understand where those data came from. And I'll, I won't feel like a complete charlatan because I showed you how it was done, but you don't want to delve too deeply into it in, unless you're really talking to theory developers. So along those lines, let me uh, mention a pet peeve, and this is really more for, uh, I don't know, theoretical modelers in general. It doesn't have to be chemistry. And I'm just going to say, if you can't explain an equation fully, and by that I mean every single term in your equation should either be obvious to your audience or you should mention what it is. Otherwise, why did you put it there? Uh, y you know, you occasionally do really need to have an equation. It's fundamental to your talk, but then take the time to explain it. And so I offer the observation here that half your audience disappears with each equation that uh, fails to have an adequate explanation. They feel a bit lost, and as they ponder that puzzle of what exactly did you mean, you flash another equation, and they didn't even have time to listen to you at that stage. So it's your job. You're the presenter. Make the equation seem intuitive. Get people in the audience to nod their heads and, and say, oh, yes, I see that. And uh, I say this as a theoretician. I sit through synthetic organic talks sometimes and see reagent acronyms flash by in large mobs. Uh, unless you know you're talking to an all-synthetic audience, that's not very helpful. You should expand those acronyms. Uh, spectra with unexplained features and so forth. And I, I guess, you know, to sum it up, if you put it on the slide, you must have thought it was important. So maybe you should explain it. And if you didn't put it on the slide, then you don't have to say much about it. So don't put things on slides just to show off how smart you are. It's, it's not a good idea. So for instance, here's one of my favorite equations. This is actually in supporting information of a paper I wrote once, but I would never want to include it in a presentation. It looks very impressive, but is it interesting? No, it's really just uh, an exercise in equation editor. Uh, quite beautiful from that standpoint, but a waste of time in your talk. All right, some technical things to uh, discuss. Uh, you, you've seen, as I've gone through here, I actually like bulleted text. I think it helps guide the audience in terms of moving along and thinking about what you're saying. I like to keep slide backgrounds simple, and uh, you know the wallpaper in the background is not what you want people focused on. You actually want them to be paying attention to the science you're describing. So if you like to use lots of animations and appear and disappear things, my advice is to keep it simple. Uh, my, when my children were young, they certainly liked to have presentations in their grade school where things exploded and tanks came driving in and towing things behind them and garish fireworks went off. Uh, there is an age where that's interesting, but I would say that uh, after a certain stage, there is no longer that age. So try to be professional. Uh, font sizes. So. I have a recommendation here that you don't use less than 14 point on a landscape slide and really only that small save for citations. If it doesn't all fit on a slide, you've got too much on a slide. You, you're hoping for a large audience in a large room, unless you know ahead of time it's a very small audience and then maybe you can uh, adjust. But, uh, you know, if people can't see things in the back rows and they're often the people who need it most, you know, the students, they always go to the back of the auditorium and they're the ones you'd really like to speak to. Uh, so be sure that the message gets across to every point in the room. And of course, when you practice, it's great to go in a room, put your slides up, walk to the back of the room, and make sure that you can see them all. Uh, so here's an example of flying things in. I'm going to show you a slide that in the end is kind of busy, but by using animation, it's, it's not so bad. Uh, and so I'm now going to show a cursor here on the screen. So I, I need to show a lot of data on one slide. And what I do is I start and I say, okay, this level of theory, and I would explain to you what CRCC was if this was a real talk, delivers some results. And I'm going to use these results as a benchmark. So I have this energy scale and I've got these uh, lines here that represent a benchmark. And then I'll talk about another theory and talk about how it does. It's got its own lines and I have these dotted lines that are helping you see the benchmark numbers come across. And you can talk about differences in numbers, for instance. And then there's some more theories that I'm interested in, and they all have their own results. And, oh, look, something happened here. I've got some bold face lines and some not bold face lines. So then I have something come in that uh, reminds me to tell you, ah, well, this is what a bold line means, and this is what a, a thin line means, and I spend some time on that. And then finally, now that you understand all the notation, I'll give you the rest of the results. And it ends up that uh, this slide now contains a lot of information, but by 
taking it a bite at a time, and I really do need to sort of see all the information on one slide, I, I haven't run into the problem that often if you just flashed it all up at once, audience members will begin puzzling for themselves. Wow, what does all that mean? And, and unfortunately, as they puzzle that and they focus on their, their visual input, they reduce their attention to their auditory input, and they don't necessarily hear what you're saying so well, and then at the end of the slide, they're confused. They're not sure what really happened. So you want to try to use the animations to guide the discussion so they're focused on the, each point as it comes up, as you think it's important. Uh, tables. So certainly lots of presentations that include data have tabular data. And here's my attitude about tabular data. Is there a number in your table that you don't plan to mention? Well, then why do you need to display it? So tune, don't just cut a table out of some other place, like a research paper or what have you. Tune the tables in your presentation to match the point you're trying to get across. Reduce the data if that's effective. Again, bigger fonts are better. You want people to be able to see it. And use the opportunity of a presentation to highlight important data. Again, draw attention where you want it. You can do that with a laser pointer, of course, but you can also do it with the graphics within your presentation software. And I like keeping borders clean and simple. That's just a general rule for slides, I think. So here's what I regard as an OK table. Uh, it's got a lot of numbers in it, and it's got some citations on the page here. This is the 14-point font I was mentioning. And uh, there are different colors, and there's some bold face, and there's some not bold face. And in the course of explaining this slide, I would tell you what these colors meant, and hopefully it would reinforce for the audience as they absorb all the numbers uh, what's going on, what's the point I'm trying to get across. A poor table is one that looks like this. So this is another uh, table. These are salvation-free energies uh, because this really does come from a research talk. So this is a talk where, for a certain reason, I chose to include a poor table. I'll, I'll talk about when you get to violate your rules later. But there's just too much data here. It's, it's highly unlikely I'm actually planning to go line by line and explain why there are these hundredths digits and go into uh, numbers at this level of detail. So probably I could reduce this. So here's a table I like best in a sense. It's only got eight numbers in it. And moreover, it's a table that is accompanied by conceptual ideas. It's not just the numbers. So here, for instance, it's an attempt to predict pKa's for uh, carbonic acid and bicarbonate. So that molecule has two pKa's, two ionizable centers. And I've got different ways to compute it based on including some specific water molecules in a calculation. And this illustrates how those water molecules are interacting with the molecule. And oh, look, this green water, well, that's the first water. And the red water, oh, look, this row is red. So that helps an audience to focus on how does the picture relate to the data, relate to the numbers that are trying to get across. And finally, here's the take home message that I want you to get from the slide. I get better accuracy. These last numbers, the blue numbers, are closest to the experiment experimental numbers, and uh, hopefully, you know, that cements a message all in one slide. Numbers, concepts, everything. It's also true if, if uh, tables and numbers and so forth should be large enough to be seen, so too for chemical structures. This is obviously most relevant to chemists. So here is a slide I've occasionally used to talk about some molecules in a talk I'm going to give. And I want to be sure I'll go to a back of a room and, and ensure, yes, I can see the font sizes of my atoms. I can uh, see the aromatic rings well enough and the data are there. If you need to show a three-dimensional structure, and increasingly as, as structures get larger and larger, you want to uh, be able to rotate them in some way so that people can appreciate them from various perspectives and, and understand their spatial uh, shape and, and the relationship between parts of the molecule. And so here's an example then. This is an embedded movie, and it's usually pretty effective, that assists people to see, look, there's some molecules on the inside. So this one is looping, which I often think is, is worthwhile if you know you're going to be talking for a while. So there are some acetonitrile molecules inside this large metal templated self-assembled cage. And in the course of a talk where I'm trying to explain about the interior volume or whatever, uh, if you just keep this picture static, and maybe I can stop it by clicking on it, there we go. You see it's much harder to appreciate that there's a void volume to understand that there's four vertices and it's roughly tetrahedral. It's worthwhile to have the animation. Uh, uh, this is 
yet another example slide. I don't want to indulge in overkill, and I don't want to run on too long for something that's online, uh, but an example of guiding the eye by introducing uh, various components one at a time. And so I'll start by saying, okay, here's a molecule I'm interested in. And it's often helpful to set things off in boxes, and the boxes may include some colors that further set it off from the page. And then I'm going to introduce some sort of a, this is a molecular orbital diagram explaining the electronic structure of this particular molecule. Again, with some sort of set off text that uh, is there. This is to speak to you about how to give a talk. Uh, and then I'll come in and say, okay, these are schematic depictions and we do calculations. And now let's see what those molecular orbitals really look like. Oh, here's a visualization of some electron density. Again, set off in a different color. Here's another one and we compare these and oh, look, this real one actually looks pretty close to this schematic one. And again, if this were a slide that had come up uh, initially with all the data on it, I think a lot of people would tune out as they sort of absorb all the colors and the shapes and perhaps miss what you had to say, but by flying it in, you're going to get additional uh, understanding. And oh, and finally, there's a little animation here that cements some message that's uh, meant to be brought across by that slide. Another slide that uh, I, I think kind of like the tabular one I showed where I emphasized it's good to have concepts and numbers, it's also often nice to have data. So here are some spectral data, and in particular, these are kinetic data along with a concept attempting to understand a rate equation for some sort of a reaction or set of reactions. And then finally, the conceptual chemical drawings that specify what are the reactions involved. So all the related data and the concepts and the conclusions, they're all in one slide. And, and that's a real goal if you can do it. And now I'm going to come back to uh, sort of conclusions, whether they be interim conclusions or final conclusions. I really like the idea of circling back when you can do it. Make sure that you're cementing your conclusions to your context, to your data. So for instance, here I've gone back to that Venn diagram I showed you and told you that I used it as a, a way to sort of introduce computational chemistry. So in a talk I give to largely undergraduate audiences, I'll have some vignettes along the way and then these arrows, the blue and, the, and the, the discussion here, the gold and the green, those are related to the vignettes, and each vignette was designed to illustrate one of these concepts that came up within the introduction. So it helps to kind of nail each thing that was discussed in the talk to the introductory material. Uh, certainly, I think most of us in, uh, in scientific fields, we want to thank our coworkers when we're all done, and uh, it's particularly nice to have some sort of visual that shows smiling faces and identify the individuals. This is one I've used in the past, and it, of course, this is a very much a matter of personal style, so it is uh, e up to each individual. And, but, uh, you know, science is a human endeavor, so thanking your human coworkers, getting across to an audience uh, that it's people who who contribute is, is only to the good of our scientific endeavors. And now I'm going to, I'm starting to wrap up here, and so I'm going to give you the, the best parts of the talk, which include the dirty little secrets. So I just came across as a pointy-headed expert, and uh, I claim that I have deep insights into exactly how to give a talk. Uh, but, you know, rules are made to be broken to some extent. So while I believe, after a lot of experience giving and listening to talks, I've given you some good, good advice, I'll also say that I have violated myself every one of the things I just told you you should or should not do. However, it was only after thinking about it, recognizing that I was going to violate a best practice rule, and asking the question, is the payoff for doing that large enough that it's worth it? Right? I'm going to... I'm going to indulge in a bit of unprofessionalism, but with a purpose, maybe to engage an audience, maybe to provoke somebody in the audience, uh, hopefully in a nice way, not in an aggressive way, but uh, in an effort to get something started that otherwise might not have happened. So, for instance, at the end of a talk, here is a particularly garish animation along the lines of the fourth grader animations I was telling you to avoid. And, uh, you know, it's the 21st century, it's the century of irony, as I like to say, so maybe I'd put that at the end of this talk to be ironic, and as a result, maybe you smile and you nod your head a little bit, and it uh, just helps you remember the talk just that much more. And, of course, the very last thing you want to do when you give a talk is you want to invite questions and discussion. Uh, that is, for 95% of all talks, that's assumed, you're not trying to rush through, you've left enough time, and... You know, the question and answer session is a particularly important one. I don't have a bunch of bullet points here that I want to get across. What I will say is, it, 
it's great to listen carefully to the question to decide whether you think the audience understood the question. Of course, if you don't understand the question, it's good to ask for clarification. But it's good to think, will the general audience understand that question? Because maybe it was, in fact, highly specific, highly specialized, but you don't want to keep it at that level. Those are the sorts of questions you might like to repeat and explain to the audience in a more general way what that question means. Don't repeat every question. I've, I've been to job talks like that where somebody was once told, repeat every question so everyone can hear it. Okay, if you didn't think it could be heard, sure, repeat it. But don't just arbitrarily repeat every question. It just looks canned and rehearsed. Uh, so those that need it because of volume or because they were very specialized, sure, go ahead and do that. And then try to give a direct answer. And if you do think that it you need to go beyond the direct answer because it raises something really interesting, you can really use it as an opportunity to get a little extra information in. So remember, I told you, don't go long. But sometimes a question invites you to add stuff that you had to cut for time purposes, and now you get to work it in. And instead of looking disrespectful at having run your audience right up to the limit, instead you've impressed people with how much more there is to your work uh, and how deeply you've thought about things, and that is a much better payoff. You, you can uh, trust me on that. Um, I like to walk towards a speaker uh, who asks me a question and to sort of engage with them closely, as well as you know, lift my head, make eye contact with the audience, uh, because that'll make others just that much more willing to ask you a question. They see that it's a, a give and take and it's going to be fun. Uh, keep answering questions until your host tells you not to, I think is a good thing. And finally, of course, once it's all done and hopefully you receive some polite applause, it's nice to smile, it's nice to say thank you, and you're all done. Now you can go and reap the rewards of your fabulous presentation. So that wraps up what I have uh, to say on this subject. I sincerely hope people find this useful. If you uh, would like to communicate with me, whether you did find it useful, you certainly are welcome to. Uh, you can email me at Kramer at umn.edu, C-R-A-M-E-R, -E at U-M-N, like University of Minnesota, dot edu. Note that if I had been better prepared, I'd have had a slide at the end with this. Uh, and I'm also on Twitter, and my Twitter handle is chemprofkramer, all one word, and I'd love to hear from you that way, too. So, wonderful to have offered this to you, and all best wishes for professional